They continued to marvel at the Blue Flower Guild's armor. Each piece was a masterpiece of design, so valuable that selling just one could afford a property in Gangnam. The second soldier expressed to the first his aspiration to join the Blue Flower Guild post service, envisioning a future where he proudly showcases their esteemed gear. The Blue Flower Guild's meeting was disrupted by the arrival of Lee and his unit. Upon their entrance, the unit swiftly formed a straight line with Lee taking the lead to count his soldiers. Once the head count was complete, Lee briefed them on the upcoming mission involving a cobalt gate. He explained that although cobalts are diminutive monsters, their use of poison needles and gas makes them formidable adversaries, often causing more casualties than battles against great orcs. Therefore, he emphasized the importance of remaining fully prepared and not underestimating the task at hand. Hearing this, a soldier promptly adjusted his uniform. This soldier questioned the necessity of such precautions, suggesting the cobalts might not pose a significant threat. Lee sternly reminded him of the seriousness of their mission, highlighting the grave risks involved, including the potential for personal injury. He concluded by instructing everyone to check their masks to ensure they were equipped to protect against poison gas, underlining the critical nature of their readiness for the encounter. The two soldiers previously mentioned approached Lee with a hint of surprise, remarking on the unexpected strategy session of what they referred to as the trash unit. The second soldier jested, implying a mix-up could occur where their unit might be confused for a support squad in a raid scenario. This banter unfortunately diminished the morale within Lee's team. Lee promptly noticing the shift in atmosphere, addressed the second soldier with urgency, explaining the dangers posed by cobalts, especially those escaping the red ground, a critical zone designated for evacuation during raids. He emphasized the importance of being prepared with gas masks, even at the rear. The second soldier, nonchalantly placing his hands on the first soldier's helmet, questioned Lee's insistence, assuring him of his self-sufficiency and dismissing the need for concern. Lee, choosing not to escalate the situation, simply reiterated his warning to remain vigilant. As the two soldiers departed, the second couldn't resist a final taunt towards Lee, referring to him derisively as the commander of the less esteemed squad, further affecting the morale of Lee's team. Lee, witnessing the dampened spirits of his unit, urged them to regain their focus. He reminded them of the gravity of their situation, where the threat of death loomed large, and underscored the importance of maintaining their resolve. This rallying call managed to rekindle a measure of determination among the soldiers. Lee elevated a motion sensor, indicating the necessity to deploy them throughout the sewers and constricted passages, due to the cobalt's diminutive stature. He allotted 20 minutes for this task, prompting the soldiers to hasten to their truck to retrieve boxes of motion sensors. As Junmo moved to assist, Lee urgently halted him. Amid efforts, the soldiers managed to lower a box, pausing briefly to ponder Lee's uncharacteristic solemnity that day. As Junmo inquired about Lee's summons, an abrupt turn of events saw Lee incapacitated by a dart to the neck, precipitating his collapse. Simultaneously, a noxious gas emanated from the sewers, swiftly engulfing the vicinity, this sudden assault claimed the lives of several soldiers caught without their protective masks. In contrast, a fortunate few, reacting promptly, managed to don their masks, averting immediate peril. This dire scenario underscored the critical importance of preparedness and vigilance in the face of unforeseen threats. In the midst of chaos, the Kobo launched their assault. Lee, immobilized by the poison from the dart, found himself face to face with the looming threat of the boss monster. Armed with a knife and a menacing grin, the monster poised to strike at Lee's eyes. At this critical moment, Junmo intervened, tackling the adversary with a swift move. Quickly, he provided Lee with a mask, underlining the urgency of the situation. Lee, despite his weakened state, insisted Junmo flee, emphasizing the need to secure his mask. Amidst the confusion, a tragic fate befell Junmo as he was abruptly decapitated. This harrowing scene mirrored an event from Lee's past, where Junmo had met a similar end. Determined to alter the outcome in this timeline, Lee focused on ensuring Jinmo's survival. Meanwhile, other soldiers had successfully installed the motion sensors and were coordinating to distribute additional units. This strategic deployment was crucial for their defense, highlighting the collective effort to navigate the perilous situation. Amid adversity, Lee's resolve to protect his comrades and adapt to changing circumstances underscored the gravity of their mission. Lee reached out to Jinmo, who promptly affirmed his readiness to execute any directive from Lee. Lee then outlined a plan indicating he would signal Junmo to evacuate the squad from the operational area at the right moment. Dunmo, taken aback, raised concerns about the possibility of armed desertion. Lee reassured him, framing the strategy not as desertion but as a calculated maneuver within the realm of war tactics. Within the control room, reports flowed in from various teams. Team Delta reported a complete loss of life in Zones 1 and 3. Similarly, Team Epsilon's update left no room for hope, with Zones 4, 5, and 6 also devoid of survivors. Team Gamma's grim report, 
highlighted the absence of survivors in the first red ground and a nearby abandoned structure. Conversely, Team Beta brought to light a significant discovery, a cobalt nest in Zone 2, harboring over 200 cobalts. Their strategy involved infiltrating the abandoned building by utilizing a wide-range magic formation. As the captain of Squad Beta initiated their assault, his team penetrated the building's defenses, advancing to the core to establish their formation. They were quickly encircled by the cobalts, which launched an aggressive onslaught in a display of tactical patience. The captain delayed his command until the critical moment, instructing the mages within his unit to unleash the flamethrower skill. This devastating attack incinerated the surrounding cobalts while the non-mages provided covering fire, a decisive move that underscored the strategic depth and cooperative dynamics of their operation. Lee's team had successfully installed motion sensors across zones 2 and 5. Amid their efforts, Min approached Lee to inquire about the ongoing work, rising to his feet. Lee saluted Min and explained their task of setting up motion sensors as per the operational manual, using aluminum tape to mark the locations. Despite the formal response, Min disparagingly addressed Lee, pointing towards the Blue Flower Guild members and criticizing Lee for overexerting on a Cobalt Gate operation. Min noted that the first platoon was due to commence its operation in 20 minutes, suggesting Lee's unit should focus on securing detox potions instead. Lee, raising his voice, reminded Mine that their directive to prevent monsters from breaching the civilian perimeter came from the vice platoon commander, drawing an unintended audience. Min, annoyed by the gathering and Lee's defiance, accused Lee of overstepping his bounds, Influenced perhaps by the battalion commander's favor, questioning Lee's combat experience with a tap on the helmet, Min expressed disbelief at Lee's audacity to offer guidance with limited battlefield exposure. Amidst this exchange, a pink-haired girl approached, adding a new dimension to the unfolding scene. Sergeant Choi, known for her proficiency as a C-rank mage specializing in healing, inquired about the tension between Min and Lee. Seizing the moment, Lee revealed his strategy. His aim was to draw Min out, with a disarming laugh, he assured Choi that he was merely providing a real-world perspective on battle dynamics to the support squad. His demeanor shifted to surprise when Choi mentioned the battalion commander's summons specifically for Lee, leading to a moment of reflection before he made his exit. Meanwhile, high above on a building's rooftop, she alongside a team of snipers, maintained vigilance. Through binoculars and sniper scopes, they kept a watchful eye on Lee, ensuring his safety from afar. As the conversation between Lee and Choi continued, she encouraged Lee not to dwell on Min's provocations, highlighting that the immediate task at hand held greater significance. Despite Lee's initial reservations about leaving the task unfinished, Choi reassured him with a confident wink. She volunteered to complete the sensor setup, urging Lee to attend to the battalion commander's call without delay. This gesture of support underscored the camaraderie and division of responsibilities within their unit, allowing Lee to focus on the pressing summon without compromising their mission's progress. Lee hesitated, pressed for time and puzzled by the battalion commander's sudden interest. Meanwhile, atop a building, a sniper consulted Yuna, expressing concern over their presence in a Kobol raid given their direct allegiance to the battalion commander. Yuna reassured the team, confirming their deployment was by the battalion commander's directive. She emphasized the military principle that soldiers are to execute commands without question, as she removed her binoculars, symbolizing their unwavering commitment to duty. This moment underscored the hierarchy and discipline inherent in military operations, particularly in the face of unexpected orders during critical missions. Upon entering the battalion commander's provisional headquarters, Lee found himself unexpectedly in the presence of Lieutenant Mungo, sparking his curiosity about their joint appearance. To temporarily assume the role of squad leader for the first platoon during Choi's absence, on a critical second strike against the gate. Internally, Lee grappled with turmoil. In his past experiences, such recognition from superiors had been foreign to him, igniting a flurry of questions about this newfound attention. With time pressing, Lee marshaled his thoughts, voicing his concerns to Kukul. He admitted his primary experience had been with the support squad, and expressed reservations about leading the first platoon in an active engagement, questioning the wisdom of entrusting their safety to him in a real battle. Koch in yielding, interlocked his fingers and reinforced the directive as an order underscoring the non-negotiable nature of military commands and the weight of responsibility suddenly thrust upon Lee. Lee, feeling trapped and frustrated, clenched his jaw tightly. The situation intensified when Delta Squad informed Coke of the boss monster's departure from the Cobalt Nest, issuing a caution to all personnel in the second and third red zones to remain vigilant. This report signaled to Lee a looming threat over the support squad, forecasting a dire outcome if he failed to act swiftly. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Lee resolved to leave Koch's command post immediately. Regardless of the consequences, he urgently requested to speak, and upon receiving Koch's nod, he swiftly articulated his thoughts. 
Moments later outside the command post, he observed Lee dashing towards his unit with urgency, a clear sign of impending danger. As Lee neared his team, he attempted to alert them about the imminent hazard. However, the motion sensors, part of their defensive setup, activated too late. The gas began to erupt from the sewers engulfing the site in a toxic cloud by the time Lee arrived, revealing the critical situation had escalated beyond control. Amidst the unfolding crisis, Lee, seized by urgency and reflection, made a daring move. After swiftly ensuring his respiratory protection, he exited the battalion commander's makeshift headquarters with a heavy heart and a critical message. Granted the floor by Koch, Lee broached a sensitive topic, the rumored tragic outcome of Koch's inaugural mission, which purportedly resulted in the loss of his entire platoon. This revelation momentarily stunned both Koch and Lieutenant Mungo, casting a solemn silence over the room. Lee pressed on, suggesting that his unexpected assignment to lead the combat squad might not be mere coincidence, but a trial of resolve and capability, despite his current rank as a corporal of the derisively termed shitty support squad. He then posed a poignant question, challenging the values and perceptions of Coxie and the military hierarchy at large. Does the revered battalion commander, whom he deeply respects, also view the lives of regular soldiers as disposable in the grand calculus of warfare? This confrontation laid bare the complexities and burdens of leadership questioning the ethical considerations within the military command structure. Koch's expression shifted to one of seriousness as he crossed his arms, prepared to address what he perceived as a misunderstanding. However, Lee, with a grave look, preempted him, asserting his willingness to sacrifice his life to obey Koch's commands. Despite internal turmoil and a sense of helplessness given his foreknowledge of events, he could not reveal. Lee earnestly conveyed to Koch his concerns about assuming leadership with his limited combat experience, potentially endangering lives. While he appreciated the trust placed in him, he could not accept it at the expense of his fellow soldiers' safety. This declaration caused Koch to become more contemplative, his demeanor cooling significantly. Lieutenant Mungo intervened, sternly reminding Lee of the grave implications of insubordination during conflict. Lee, though inwardly questioning if his superiors underestimated his awareness of the stakes, recognized the urgency of the situation for the rear guard. Unexpectedly, Koch decided to permit Lee to proceed with a support mission, signaling a tacit acknowledgement of his concerns. He cautioned Lee, however, about the impending consequences of his decision to defy orders, framing it as a test of his resolve and dedication as a soldier. In the thick of the moment, Lee quickly donned a gas mask for protection. From the utility bag strapped to his right leg, a versatile storage for military essentials, he retrieved the cloud blade. The unique feature of this blade is its capacity to integrate with natural elements, demonstrated as Lee doused it with water from his canteen. The blade's absorption rate escalated to 25.5, signifying its readiness for combat. Amidst these preparations, Lee's focus remained unwaveringly on his platoon's safety. He harbored hopes that Junmo had heeded his advice to evacuate, reflecting his strategic mindset even in dire situations. Suddenly, the tense silence was shattered by a soldier's cry for help, a kobol having inflicted a severe wound with its pickaxe. This act of aggression prompted Junmo into action. He retaliated with a barrage of gunfire aiming to deter the monster and protect his fellow soldier. The kobold, agile and cunning, evaded the onslaught, retreating from the immediate threat. With the immediate danger momentarily abated, Junmo rallied the support squad, instructing them to seek refuge within a designated safety zone, underlining the importance of unity and tactical retreat in ensuring their collective survival amidst the chaos of battle. As the squad mobilized to extract their wounded comrade, known as Private on Minty, into the safety of the box, Sergeant Choi, the unit's healer and deputy platoon leader succumbed to the overwhelming stress of the situation. Despite Junmo's attempts to rally her spirits, Choi's panic underscored the harrowing realities of combat, particularly for those facing the front lines for the first time. Her reaction, while understandable given her youth and inexperience, highlighted the psychological toll exacted by the battlefield. Amidst dwindling ammunition and escalating tension, the squad faced a dire situation. Reports of the last magazine rounds triggered a palpable sense of despair. Junmo, grappling with the impending crisis, wondered about their fate and contemplated how Corporal Lee might have maneuvered in such a predicament. The urgency intensified as a soldier caring for Private on Minty relayed the critical need for medical intervention to Sergeant Choi. In a moment of quick thinking, Lee reached into his inventory bag, extracting a metallic object. Simultaneously, the grim announcement of expended ammunition echoed amongst them. With all eyes on him, Junmo unveiled his plan, leveraging the Cobalt's attraction to shiny objects. He proposed a daring strategy to use the metallic item to distract the kobolds, providing an opportunity for the platoon to escape with the vice platoon leader and the wounded. The soldiers, taken aback by Junmo's unconventional tactic, exchanged bewildered glances, 
Questioning the feasibility of such a plan, June Mo's initiative, inspired by desperation and ingenuity, reflected a willingness to explore unconventional methods to safeguard the lives of his comrades, embodying the essence of leadership and quick adaptation in the face of overwhelming odds. Juno brandishing a metallic object now crackling with electricity conveyed a crucial command to his fellow soldiers. He informed them of Lee's intelligence. The Blue Flower Guild awaited just beyond the red ground. With this knowledge, he instructed them to muster every ounce of courage and sprint towards the guild upon his cue. Facing the Cobalts, Junmo reflected on his own modest electric abilities, which, despite their limitations in combat, now offered a means to safeguard lives in a pivotal moment. As he initiated the escape plan, Junmo charged into the swarm of Cobalts, elevating the electrified object to draw their attention with its gleam and the noise it generated. The creatures, mesmerized by the shiny, buzzing artifact, pursued him, allowing Junmo to divert them from his comrades, urging the squad to seize this opportunity and escape. Junmo propelled himself further into danger, silently acknowledging that in a similar situation, Lee might have also utilized him as a distraction. This selfless act of bravery underscored the strategic sacrifice for the greater good, encapsulating the essence of camaraderie and tactical ingenuity in the face of adversity. In a daring maneuver, Jumo attracted the Cobalt's attention with a shining metallic object, executing a desperate strategy to draw them away from his squad. His efforts seemed to pay off until, amidst the chaos, he collided with an unexpected ally and tumbled to the ground. Recognizing the figure before him, Junmo was greeted with a mix of relief and surprise. Lee, stepping into the fray, brandished the cloud blade, activating its unique wet fog effect. This innovative use of the blade began to dissipate the poisonous gas enveloping them, providing much needed relief. Lee's timely intervention, marked by the deployment of the cloud blade's capabilities, showcased a blend of quick thinking and strategic resourcefulness. Calling out to Junmo, Lee signaled a turning point in their dire situation. The wet fog not only neutralized the immediate threat of the toxic gas, but also symbolized a beacon of hope for the beleaguered squad. This act of ingenuity underlined the importance of adaptability and teamwork in overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds. Junimo somewhat sheepishly clarified that his earlier actions were an attempt to emulate Lee's bravery and decisiveness, admitting he might have gotten a bit overzealous. Lee, upon hearing this, expressed his gratitude and relief that Junmo was still alive. With a genuine smile, he commended Junmo for his commendable efforts, which moved Junmo deeply. Despite the emotional moment, the surrounding monsters grew increasingly agitated, unfazed by the human sentiment. Lee, undeterred, voiced his admiration for Junmo gallant efforts, which had inadvertently set the stage for a confrontational feast. With a fighter's resolve and a grin, Lee jestingly mentioned how Junmo had prepared such a sumptuous meal, for him referring to the impending battle with the Cobalts. As he engaged the Cobalts with his combat knife, slaying another wave of the encroaching foes, the fallen Cobalts yielded Mona Steel. Lee eyeing the Mona Steel, playfully remarked on its desirability, teasing Junmo about the missed opportunity to feast on it due to the situation. Junmo, puzzled by Lee's comment, questioned him, only to be met with a mock annoyed glare from Lee, hinting at an inside joke about the impracticality of consuming Mona Steel. This exchange lightened the moment, blending humor with the stark reality of their battlefield camaraderie. As the Cobalt suddenly retreated, their magical symbols illuminating in unison, Lee identified this shift as a potential threat to their squad. Alerting Junmu of the immediate danger, he led the chase across the rooftops, determined to intercept the fleeing monsters. Meanwhile, the observation squad, hindered by the dense gas, relayed their visual limitations to Yuna. Acknowledging the complexity of providing direct support, Yuna commanded them to hold their position, focusing on eliminating any cobalts breaching the perimeter, thereby safeguarding civilians from potential harm. Understanding the gravity of the situation, the snipers affirmed their readiness to execute the defensive strategy. Curiosity piqued by Lee's actions, which suggested foreknowledge of the unfolding events, Yuna decided to delve deeper, equipping her gas mask. She ventured into the mist, intent on unraveling the mystery behind Lee's anticipatory maneuvers. This proactive approach underscored a commitment to adapting strategies in real time, ensuring the safety of both their forces and the civilians beyond the battlefield. Within the confines of the box, Sergeant Choice found herself overwhelmed by panic, her distress amplified by the dire situation unfolding around her. Her calls for help echoed, accompanied by tears, as she grappled with the fear and chaos. Amidst this turmoil, a soldier attending to Private on Minty conveyed the urgency of the moment. On Minty had lost consciousness and was teetering on the edge of survival. The soldier implored Sergeant Choice to summon her strength and healing abilities to save on Minty, emphasizing the immediacy of the need for medical intervention. Outside, the security of the box was compromised as the lookout soldiers alerted the team to an imminent three. 
The boss monster was actively dismantling their temporary shelter with a potent spell. Despite the valiant efforts of two soldiers who attempted to counteract the monster's spell by physically securing the structure, the spell's overwhelming force succeeded in breaching the box's barriers. This development not only intensified the peril faced by those inside, but also highlighted the critical need for cohesion, courage, and immediate action to safeguard the lives at stake. As the cobalts encircled the box, the atmosphere thickened with despair. The soldiers, grappling with the looming threat, found themselves questioning their fate. Amidst the tension, the boss monster revealed in the chaos, its grin broadening at the sight of the disarray. But in a pivotal moment, Lee's commanding voice pierced through the turmoil, accompanied by his imposing silhouette emerging behind the advancing cobalts. With a declaration of defiance, he warned the adversaries against further aggression towards his team. Lee's swift maneuver brought his combat knife to a hair's breadth away from the boss monster, who narrowly avoided a decisive blow. The knife, guided by Lee's intent, pursued the boss monster with relentless precision, resembling a missile locked onto its target. Although the direct hit was evaded, Lee succeeded in impairing the device responsible for the toxic gas, disrupting the enemy's advantage. This act of sabotage infuriated the boss monster, triggering a reactive glow from the magic circles adorning the cobalt's foreheads, signaling a heightened state of alert and aggression. In a sudden shift, the cobalts dispersed, launching a barrage of toxic needles towards Lee and Jun Mo. Lee with swift reflexes positioned himself to intercept the incoming assault using the cloud blade, creating a barrier against the deadly projectiles. Yet, a second volley from another direction caught him off guard. Acting swiftly, Lee pushed Jun Mo to safety and employed his metal control ability to halt the needle's advance, albeit at the cost of losing grip on his combat knife. The boss monster observed with a growing sense of menace, taking pleasure in the turn of events. Frustration mounting, Lee reassessed the situation. It became evident that the Dark Cobalt Mage wasn't just directing the Cobalts but had them under direct manipulation. Switching tactics, Lee drew his firearm and engaged, but the Cobalts, nimble and alert, evaded the shots, recognizing the futility of intimidation and the risks of combat with Junmo at his side. Lee decided on a strategic withdrawal to the box. Junmo, caught in the moment, sought confirmation of their next move. Upon Lee's command, the duo sprinted towards safety, dodging a flurry of toxic needles launched in their wake. With a glance over his shoulder, Lee discerned the imminent danger and skillfully redirected the airborne threats away from them, showcasing his adept metal control abilities. Once Jumo reached the sanctuary of the box, Lee followed suit, ensuring their narrow escape. Inside, Lee witnessed the barrier repelling the poisonous projectiles, much to the boss monster's ire. Safely within the confines of the box, Lee faced his squad with a reassuring smile, acknowledging his delayed arrival but relieved to have joined them. However, the somber faces and evident injuries among his squad members painted a stark contrast to his relief. Amidst this, Jun Mo approached with urgent news about Private on Mini's condition, heightening the gravity of their situation. In a critical moment of urgency, Lee found himself perplexed by Jun Mo's plea for help, especially with Sergeant Choi, their designated healer, present yet incapacitated by a panic attack. Confronting the gravity of the situation Private on Minty's life, hanging in the balance Lee's frustration became palpable as he faced Choi's immobilized state. Taking decisive action, Lee called out to Sergeant Choi, attempting to pierce through her panic with the urgency of their dire circumstance. When verbal attempts failed to elicit a response, Lee resorted to a shocking but effective method to snap her back to reality. With confusion briefly clearing her panic-stricken gaze, Choice was confronted with Lee's stark inquiry about their survival and her role in it. Lee's stern reminder of their battlefield context, and his probing question about Choi's willingness to live with regret aimed to rekindle her sense of duty and the critical importance of her contributions. This moment highlighted the harsh realities faced in combat, underscoring the necessity for mental resilience and the pivotal role of each member in the survival of the team. Lee's pressing question about the toll of a life marred by regret jolted Choi back to reality. She promptly began her healing duties on private on Minty, focusing her abilities to counteract the critical blood loss he suffered due to the delay. After a tense period, Lee inquired about on Minty's status, Choi acknowledging the gravity of the delay yet refusing to succumb to despair, committed to her healing efforts. Lee's response was a warm smile, a gesture of gratitude for her renewed determination. Turning to the wider squad, Lee declared his intention to requisition their combat knives. With his ability to manipulate metal, he effortlessly extracted the knives from their belongings. This unexpected move left Junmo hesitating, questioning Lee's next steps. Facing Junmo's uncertainty, Lee's expression hardened with resolve. He articulated the necessity of confronting the monsters, intent on repaying the onslaught they had endured. This decisive moment underscored Lee's leadership and his unwavering commitment to safeguarding his team and challenging the adversities head-on. 
As the narrative transitions, the scene shifts dramatically to a high-speed car journey down a highway, where a woman's voice fills the interior, lively discussing a fascinating occurrence. After concluding the call with a hint of amusement, she declares the need for a personal visit to offer solace, directing her driver towards I.D., the locus of the ongoing battle. Meanwhile, Lee emerges from the box, advancing through the toxic miasma with the cloud blade held aloft, a beacon in the murky expanse. Cobalts lurk in the shadows, their forms barely discernible as they watch Lee's determined stride. Coming to a halt at a strategically marked spot, Lee finds himself in the calculated center of their operation zone, a trap he had meticulously prepared while his comrades were engaged in sensor setup. Observing from afar, the boss monster commands its minions to swarm Lee unaware of the trap that awaits. As the cobalts close in, Lee's smile broadens, a silent acknowledgement of the impending tactical advantage. He had drawn his adversaries into an ideal ambush location, leveraging the battlefield's layout to his favor. This moment of strategic cunning underscores Lee's foresight and readiness, setting the stage for a confrontation where the hunter becomes the hunted. Within the tension-filled ambiance of the battlefield, Lee pinpointed a crucial flaw in Section A, under Vice Platoon Leader Sana's command. Recognizing the opportunity to target the orchestrator behind the Cobalt's assault, Lee's strategy shifted towards a decisive confrontation. With a moment of concentration, he employed his metal detection skill, visualizing the metallic signatures around him. This unique ability illuminated the presence of approaching Cobalt's, betrayed by the distinct metal of their pickaxes among the familiar. Eyes opening with clarity and purpose, Lee unleashed his metal control skill, orchestrating the combat knives in a lethal dance. The blades, now extensions of his will, swept through the advancing cobalts with ruthless efficiency. The unexpected ferocity of Lee's counterattack sent the boss monster into a state of panic. Amidst its alarm, one of Lee's controlled knives cleverly maneuvered, poised to strike the monster unawares. This moment, a testament to Lee's tactical genius and mastery over his abilities, highlighted a critical turning point in the battle. With the enemy's numbers dwindling and the orchestrator exposed, the tide seemed poised to turn, marking a pivotal moment in their struggle for survival and victory. As the confrontation intensified, Lee faced a pivotal moment when his combat knife was halted by an unseen force, signaling the presence of the boss monster. Recognizing the challenge, Lee redirected his focus, commanding a quintet of combat knives towards his adversary. The boss monster's powerful magic and a fearsome battle cry momentarily unsettled Lee, revealing the depth of its power as it effortlessly neutralized the flying knives. The ensuing standoff saw the boss monster locking eyes with Lee, a silent battle of wills unfolding. Lee's attempt to reclaim the combat knives hit an unexpected obstacle, a system notification stating the knives were restrained by a magic exceeding his control ability. This revelation left Lee questioning the effectiveness of his metal manipulation skill against such formidable magic. Undeterred, the boss monster strategized, orchestrating a volley of poisonous needles aimed at Lee's vulnerable spots. This maneuver underscored the cunning and strategic depth of the adversary Lee faced, heightening the stakes of the battle and challenging Lee to adapt to an opponent capable of countering his abilities. Caught off guard, Lee was overwhelmed by a sudden onslaught of poisonous needles. As he shielded himself, the impact forced him to his knees, momentarily relinquishing control over the combat knives aimed at the boss monster. Seizing the opportunity, the boss monster directed a merciless wave of cobalts to converge on the vulnerable Lee. Despite the perilous moment, Lee's indomitable spirit shone through. Clenching his teeth in defiance, he refused to accept defeat, reminiscent of his past trials. The realization that his ordeal could mirror past failures spurred him into action. Fortuitously, his body transformation skill, a testament to his resilience and preparation, mitigated the poison's lethal effect. As the needles dropped away, his determination only intensified. So with renewed focus, Lee summoned the combat knives back to his side, his expression hardened with resolve. This moment highlighted not only Lee's tactical acumen, but also his sheer will to overcome adversity, setting the stage for a pivotal counterattack against the encroaching Cobalts and their formidable leader. Lee, with a fierce shout, dismissed the advancing Cobalts as mere nuisances. He conjured a formidable vortex around him by propelling the combat knives at extraordinary speeds. This whirlwind not only thwarted the Cobalts' attack, but also carved a path through the poisonous gas, momentarily purifying the air around him. Emboldened, Lee then called out to the boss monster, signaling a final confrontation to resolve their conflict. The boss monster, undeterred, unleashed an even denser cloud of poison from its gourd, engulfing the area once more. Fortunately, Lee's cloud blade continued to shield him from the toxic assault, allowing him to maintain clarity amidst the chaos. Proclaiming to the obscured enemy, Lee declared the futility of its resistance, questioning whether it recognized the extent of his efforts to ensure this moment, where only the boss remained as his target. Employing his metal detection skill once again, 
Lee pinpointed the boss monster's location amidst the haze. This preparation set the stage for a decisive encounter, highlighting Lee's strategic foresight and resilience. His determination to end the battle on his terms underscored a narrative of perseverance and cunning in the face of overwhelming odds. Lee, exercising caution, scrutinized the boss monster's every move, acutely aware that a direct assault with the combat knives could lead to their seizure as before. His vigilance heightened when he noticed the boss monster's hand planted firmly on the ground, its posture unchanging. This observation prompted Lee to question the creature's strategy, only to realize too late that it was a trap as magic tendrils neared his foot. Caught off guard, Lee attempted to retreat, but the boss monster's magic ensnared his leg, destabilizing him and causing him to fall backward. Utilizing its magic, the boss monster lifted Lee above the swirling miasma of poison gas, only to hurl him into a denser cloud of the toxic vapors. This harrowing moment underscored the cunning and ruthless tactics employed by the boss monster, challenging Lee's resilience and strategic prowess. With the stakes dramatically escalated, Lee found himself navigating not only the physical confrontation, but also the psychological warfare waged by his formidable adversary. Emerging from the toxic mists, Lee's defiant voice cut through the boss monster's premature celebrations, calling it a little rat. This unexpected challenge took the boss monster by surprise, shifting its focus back to Lee, who, despite the ordeal, stood resolute and visibly worn, with his legs bolstered by his ability just enough to withstand the assault. Lee confronted the creature, his expression a mix of rage and defiance. He questioned the boss monster's mockery and its intent to dredge up his traumatic memories. In a swift maneuver, the boss monster, embodying both cunning and agility, circled behind Lee, brandishing its dagger for a stealthy strike. This moment encapsulated the high stakes of their confrontation, highlighting Lee's resilience against the backdrop of his adversary's relentless pursuit. The battle, far from a mere physical clash, delved into the psychological resilience required to face and overcome one's past fears and traumas head-on. Alert to the impending strike, Lee sidestepped the boss monster's dagger thrust, evading injury with a swift maneuver. Shocked by the audacity of the attack aimed at his back, Lee retaliated with a forceful downward slash of the cloud blade, challenging the boss monster's underhanded tactics. As the boss parried the initial attack, Lee augmented his physical prowess with a body-strengthening skill, delivering a powerful kick to the creature's visage, articulating his belief in the monster's deserving retribution. The impact of Lee's kick was both immediate and dramatic, fracturing the boss monster's mask and propelling it into a staggering retreat. Advancing towards the dazed adversary, Lee conveyed the depth of his longing for this moment of retribution, questioning the monster on its awareness of the countless times he had envisioned exacting revenge for the betrayal he endured. This exchange underscored the culmination of Lee's resilience, skill, and unwavering determination to confront and overcome the shadows of his past. Since the day of his regression, Lee had harbored a burning anticipation for this confrontation. Facing the boss monster, now diminished and maskless, its magical defenses crippled, Lee's resolve intensified. His grin mirrored not just satisfaction, but a deep-seated resolve to turn the tide of his haunted past. With the source of its power, the mask, now in ruins, Lee saw an opportunity to confront his demons directly. Harnessing his metal control skill with renewed purpose, Lee directed the combat knives with precision striking the boss monster and shattering its gird. As the creature writhed in agony, Lee's approach was methodical, each step carrying the weight of his long-awaited vengeance. He remarked on the boss monster's pitiful state, yet reminded it of its lingering fight for life. Hoisting the boss monster into the air by its maw, Lee's voice carried the chill of unyielding winter as he confronted it with the weight of his years in bondage, a direct consequence of its actions. His declaration that the combat knives, now enacting retribution, once belonged to comrades fallen by this very monster's hand, added layers to his resolve. He invoked the memory of Jumo, a comrade lost in sacrifice, dedicating his impending strike to the spirit of the fallen. With a decisive thrust of the cloud blade, Lee punctuated his vow of vengeance. At that moment, the system delivered a notification, a testament to the significance of his Akin. The cloud blade had begun to assimilate the blood of the elite monster, embarking on a process to harness an enigmatic energy with only one of the transformation completed. As the cloud blade absorbed its blood, the formidable adversary gradually weakened. Utilizing his mastery over metal, Lee maneuvered the creature's dagger, directing it towards its forehead, signaling an imminent conclusion. He silently communicated his intent for retribution, reflecting on the scar that marked him in a past life. With precision, he cleaved the creature's face, a symbolic act of vengeance. The creature's form then collapsed, the cloud blade embedded within, marking a significant victory. A notification appeared, indicating the blade was now eleven charged with a mysterious energy, hinting at latent abilities awaiting to be unleashed upon full saturation. He gazed upon the fallen, 
a sense of closure enveloping him as he rectified a haunting chapter of his history. In the aftermath, a medallion emerged from the defeated, hinting at further adventures and secrets yet to be uncovered. Lee's discovery of the Hellfire Medallion, an artifact brimming with demonic power, left him astounded. Upon inspection, the system revealed its prestigious rank within the Metal series. The Devil's Medallion Inferno, a name synonymous with unparalleled strength, Lee, perplexed by its unexpected appearance, pondered its significance. This medallion was associated with a formidable adversary, a necromancer who commanded an undead army, bringing despair to humanity. Information on this foe was scarce. Yet Lee understood they shared a unique trait of growth following regression, a secret he had concealed in his previous life to avoid detection and ensure progression from his initial rank. The confrontation at the necromancer's workshop, where Lee obtained only a replica of the Inferno after a grueling battle, now seemed to foreshadow unknown aspects of their intertwined destinies. The appearance of the original medallion raised questions and suspicions in Lee's mind as he contemplated the unfolding mystery. He noticed the dissipating poisonous cloud, a sign of changing tides. Deciding to assimilate the Inferno's power immediately, Lee prepared for the challenges and revelations that lay ahead, his resolve unwavering in the face of the unknown. In a moment of abrupt interruption, as Lee was about to harness the Inferno medallion's power, Yuna's voice halted him. Brandishing her sword, she demanded identification and transparency regarding his secrets. Reacting swiftly, Lee employed his metal control to secure the medallion in his back pocket, raising his hands in a gesture of innocence while feigning confusion at her accusations. Internally, Lee acknowledged his precarious situation, uncertain of the extent of the battle Yuna had witnessed. Amidst this tense standoff, the woman from the earlier vehicle emerged, her applause cutting through the tension. She remarked on the spectacle of Lee's battle from a distance, lauding its impressiveness. Removing her gas mask, she recognized Yuna as the third daughter of the paladin's captain, expressing astonishment at her grown stature. Upon recognizing the woman, Lee's gaze turned icy, his displeasure unmistakable. Yuna asserted her authority as the captain of the 1st Battalion and Attack Squad of the 3rd Amp Brigade, reminding the intruder of the military exclusivity of the area, off-limits to civilians. Yet, the woman unfazed approached Lee, presenting her guild card as an introduction. She identified herself as Catherine, leader of the Blue Flower Guild's premier attack unit, and the scion of Korea's most formidable civilian guild. Catherine anticipated Lee's awe as she proffered the guild's emblem but was met with indifference. His disinterest piqued her curiosity, wondering if her reputation had not preceded her. Lee, struggling to cloak his anger, was painfully aware of who Catherine was. She stood among those who posed a significant threat to humanity, an entity he could not dismiss from memory. In a pivotal moment, Yuna positioned herself to shield Lee from an impending assault, urging him to persevere at all costs. Sal's insistence on her withdrawal was met with defiance. Yuna, with a reassuring smile, declared her resolve to protect him embodying the role of his guardian in the face of danger. Lee's past was shadowed by a grim memory, where Yuna fell victim to a swarm of lethal insects, an act orchestrated by Catherine, forever branding her as the orchestrator of Si Yuna's demise. In the present, Catherine, with an air of confidence, extended the Blue Flower Guild's card towards Lee, suggesting a significant opportunity lay before him. Despite her gesture, Lee remained silent, his body quivering as he fought to suppress his burgeoning rage. Yuna standing firm reiterated to Catherine the gravity of their location as a military zone, and urged her departure. Catherine unfazed subtly challenged Yuna's adherence to military protocol, hinting at her own prestigious position within the Blue Flower Guild's elite attack squads. As tension mounted between the two women, a military vehicle arrived heralding the appearance of Koch. Yuna promptly saluted and began to relay the current situation. However, Koch, prioritizing the gravity of their surroundings, deferred the briefing upon noticing the cobalt corpses scattered about. Koch's attention then shifted to the boss monster's body, still impaled by Lee's cloud blade. As Koch surveyed the scene, Lee's anxiety escalated, realizing the gravity of the situation. Koch's gaze finally rested on Lee, causing a tumult of guilt within him, though Lee managed to quell his inner turmoil, resolving to confront the situation himself. The encounter between Koch and Catherine unfolded with formal pleasantries, during which Koch acknowledged the assistance provided by the Blue Flower Guild. However, he emphasized the protocol governing military zones, noting that unauthorized access, regardless of affiliation, necessitated departure. Catherine, displaying a hint of frustration at the rigidity of military conduct, remarked on the inconvenience of such protocols obstructing her intentions. In a gesture mixing defiance with invitation, she pressed a kiss to the guild card, marking it with lipstick, and tucked it into Lee's armor, suggesting he contact her. As Catherine withdrew, Koch beckoned Lee, his call prompting an automatic response. This sequence of events underscores the complex, 
interplay of military order, personal vendettas, and guild politics, encapsulating a moment fraught with tension and unspoken alliances against the backdrop of a world embroiled in fantastical and military conflict. Upon receiving Koch's directive, Lee aligned himself with military posture, hands at his sides. Koch with a tone embodying both authority and formality, appointed Lee as the squad commander for the Cobalt operation, emphasizing the imperative of survivor rescue and the allocation of squad responsibilities. This declaration left both Yuna and Lee taken aback, with Lee scrutinizing Koch for any underlying motives, Koch had clarified that further details would be addressed in the debriefing post-operation, instructing Lee to report back to him and an individual he cryptically referred to as that person. Accepting his new role, Lee watched as Koch and Yuna departed, Yuna casting a piercing look that unsettled him. Despite the unease, Lee recognized the silver lining in surpassing his immediate predicament. A week later, within the confines of the 3rd Amp Brigade's base, the 1st Battalion was notified by the system of a significant development. The complete integration of the Devil's Medallion Inferno, resulting in a substantial enhancement of Lee's metal control capabilities, now at a remarkable 3,458 grams. Amidst this revelation, peculiar sounds emanated from a bathroom stall, heralding another system update for Lee Asi. The inception of a breath room within his stomach, marking the beginning of yet another mysterious transformation. The system alerted Lee of the impending severe discomfort associated with the transformation process. Within the confines of a restroom stall, Lee was found grappling with intense pain as flames burst forth from his mouth, a testament to the ongoing metamorphosis. This ordeal was not unfamiliar to Lee, having endured it in a previous existence. However, his current physical vulnerability intensified the agony beyond his recollections. Jun Mo entering the restroom was greeted by the unusual cacophony emanating from Lee's stall. Recognizing Lee's voice, Jun Mo approached, playfully inquiring about Lee's solitary engagement with what he presumed was entertainment. Lee amidst worsening torment, and with eyes beginning to radiate, corrected Jun Mo's misconception, signaling the start of his ascension. Skeptical, Jun Mo half-jokingly requested to be shown the goods later, only to be startled by a dazzling illumination from Lee's stall. Lee in desperation, reiterated the misunderstanding as Jun Mo stood bewildered. In the aftermath of a critical event, Sergeant Choi played a pivotal role in rescuing Private Unminty from a dire situation, ensuring his safe transfer to a military hospital. This experience prompted Lee to reconsider his solitary approach to protection. He initiated training programs for the support squad, aiming to empower them with self-defense capabilities. Yet the Cobblegate incident introduced two significant challenges for Lee. Firstly, Sergeant Choi became increasingly involved in his affairs, complicating his efforts to execute plans within the military's unpredictable environment. Secondly, Koch proposed that Lee transition from a non-commissioned officer role to a commissioned officer role, suggesting a path divergent from Lee's current trajectory. Battalion Commander Koch observed Lee's performance during the Aiden operation, seeing it as evidence of Lee's potential to contribute to a reimagined military ethos where rank is secondary to merit and capability. Despite Koch's enthusiasm, Lee was ambivalent, puzzled by Koch's intention to integrate him into this visionary project. With a tone of hesitation, Lee mentioned he would ponder this proposition during his upcoming vacation, reflecting on the implications for his future within the military structure. This scenario encapsulates Lee's confrontation with evolving responsibilities and the possibility of aligning personal ambitions with broader institutional reforms. Three weeks later, as Lee embarked on his much-anticipated vacation, he found himself engaged in an unusual enlightenment process within the solitude of a bathroom. This unexpected journey led to the fulfillment of a unique condition, prompting the system to notify him of a newly acquired skill, a skill named Fire Skill. Breath Room introduced two transformative effects. The primary effect, known as in vivo furnace, significantly enhances the speed of metal absorption with an efficiency range between 50 to 250%. This development marks a pivotal moment in Lee's journey endowing him with capabilities that could potentially redefine his interaction with the metallic elements in his environment. As Lee embraced the dual capabilities of his new fire skill, Breath Room, he acknowledged the stark reality. The furnace's efficiency directly correlated with increased agony. The second prowess, Fire Breath, enabled him to expel stored metal as a devastating attack, consuming 3G of metal with each use. Exhausted, Lee pondered in the restroom, the steam rising off him as a testament to his ordeal, humorously contemplating how the skill could dispel any bizarre rumors associated with his bathroom visits. After collecting himself and washing away the remnants of his trial, Lee confronted a sobering realization at the sinks. His current state might prove inadequate for the challenges ahead. Memories of Kayak's public scrutiny and the tragic outcomes at Soul Station weighed heavily on him. 
underscoring the urgency to prepare during his vacation to avert a similar fate. Lee's encounter with Choi revealed a moment of unguarded authenticity, leading to an unexpected silence as both grappled with the situation. This candid interaction transitions to an uneasy train ride shared between them. Choi attempting to engage Lee inquired about his long-awaited vacation and the anticipated joy of his parents. Lee's response, disclosing the loss of his parents at a young age, momentarily dampened the conversation. Noticing the discomfort his answer caused, Lee, with a reassuring smile, elaborated on his journey from solitude to finding a sense of belonging among those who became akin to family. This sparked curiosity in Choi, prompting her to seek clarification on Lee's notion of family. Reflecting on his past, Lee contemplated the bonds formed with individuals who had stood by him, pondering whether to classify these connections as friendships, professional relationships, or comradeship forged in adversity. As he looked out the train window, a smile emerged, symbolizing his recognition of the deep, familial ties he had developed beyond traditional definitions. This introspective moment underscores the theme of finding family in unexpected places, highlighting the strength and comfort derived from the bonds formed through shared experiences and challenges. Lee mulled over the appropriate term to describe those pivotal figures from his past, eventually settling on comrades in arms as the most fitting description. This term encapsulated the deep bonds forged in the heat of shared struggles and triumphs. Hiding from the train, Lee was acutely aware that his vacation spanned only four days and three nights, a brief interlude in which he was determined to lay the groundwork for future endeavors. Among his priorities was the acquisition of financial resources. While navigating through the city, his attention was captured by a recruitment poster for the Blue Tree Guild. Lee was well aware of the guild's owner, a figure whose wealth reached into the trillions and who had deftly navigated the murky waters of financial and political influence to secure a dominant position. This realization underscored a critical lesson from humanity's past failures. The decisive role of financial power. Convinced that matching Gordon's financial clout was an unrealistic goal, Lee nonetheless recognized the importance of securing sufficient funds to avoid being marginalized in the looming economic battles. With a clear understanding of future trends and potential investment opportunities, Lee knew that even modest investments made with foresight could yield significant returns. Determined to find a trustworthy ally for his investment strategies, Lee stepped into a building marked by a wooden sign proclaiming Hope Guild. This move was driven by his desire to identify a partner whose loyalty and integrity would remain unshaken regardless of the circumstances. As Lee ascended the staircase, driven by the intent to find a trustworthy collaborator for a mission critical to his future, the sounds of a heated argument caught his attention. The confrontation was between a man with striking white hair, who was in the midst of a tense exchange with another individual donned in a green suit. The crux of their disagreement stemmed from the green-suited man's concern over the scarcity of clients that month, a point met with indifference by the white-haired man. The latter dismissed the issue, suggesting that the solution lay in accepting jobs that others deemed unworthy, underscoring a disdain for roles that he perceived as beneath him, specifically mentioning his refusal to work as a guard at events, which he found demeaning. The moment Lee entered the room, the dynamic shifted dramatically with both individuals turning towards the door in surprise. This encounter encapsulated Lee's search for a partner who could navigate the challenges ahead with unwavering fidelity and commitment, even in the face of adversity or humble beginnings. Lee's arrival signified the potential for a new direction or alliance, setting the stage for a pivotal moment in his quest. Upon Lee's entry, the white-haired individual instantly recognized him, warmly addressing him as Tin Compoit, a nickname hinting at past camaraderie. This reunion sparked a memory of their first encounter, a moment when Lee, then struggling with his newfound abilities, was grateful for any form of acknowledgement. Despite the passage of time, Lee's response was cool, suggesting that their history did not warrant a warm exchange. He instead turned his attention to the man in the green suit, Chiyo Aliu, greeting him with evident familiarity, which hinted at a different, more positive connection between them. Chiyo Su Aliu, taken aback by Lee's sudden appearance, inquired about the purpose of his visit, breaking the tension in the room. Meanwhile, the white-haired man, still reeling from Lee's indifferent reception, mockingly questioned Lee's memory, implying that their past interactions had been more significant than Lee's demeanor suggested. This provoked a sharp look from Lee, a silent warning of the boundaries between them. A flashback revealed the depth of their troubled history, showcasing a moment when Lee's attempt to demonstrate his awakening with mundane metal objects fell flat, leading to public ridicule. The white-haired man's frustration at being associated with what he perceived as mediocrity escalated into physical aggression, a painful memory for Lee that underscored the complexity of their relationship. This scene, blending past and present, reveals the intricate web of personal histories, evolving abilities, and shifting alliances, all playing out within the guild's walls, 
highlighting the nuanced dynamics of power, friendship, and identity within the fantastical realm they inhabit. In a moment charged with tension, who recognized as a C rank hunter, and the Hope Guild's signature fighter began to confront Lee, echoing a history of animosity rooted in their school days. With sleeves rolled up, he menacingly referred to Lee by an old nickname, Tin Pilot, hinting at a past filled with domination and fear. Woe's intent was clear, to revert to their previous dynamic where Lee was subjugated and humiliated. Attempting to defuse the escalating situation, Chu intervened, positioning himself as a barrier between the two. Yet Hao's anger was beyond containment, his rage boiling over, threatening anyone who dared to stand in Lee's defense. In a bold defiance, Lee invited to his aggression, his cold stare and challenging words catching to off guard. This was not the response who had anticipated. The prey was not showing fear, but instead issuing a challenge. As Hu launched himself at Lee, fueled by fury, his attack halted midair. The room's atmosphere shifted dramatically when Tu realized he was suddenly at the mercy of Lee, who, without moving, had various swords and weapons pointed at him. This power shift stunned Wo, revealing a new dynamic where Lee was no longer the defenseless target but a formidable adversary. Lee's demeanor was icy as he clarified his capabilities, suggesting that while he might not secure a decisive victory over Wo, he could inflict significant damage, equating the aftermath to an assault by an entire military unit. His stern gaze underscored his readiness to neutralize was close-range combat advantage, if necessary. Wu, confronted with the array of weapons Lee controlled, recognized the tangible threat Lee posed. The tension was abruptly interrupted by the arrival of another individual, prompting Tu and his companion to consider their schedule. Lee, seizing the opportunity, diffused the situation by adopting a facade of apology and embracing Tu in a feigned gesture of reconciliation. This sudden shift perplexed Wu especially as Lee whispered rumors of Yu's past mishap during a raid, information that should have been private. This confusion and shock at Lee's knowledge of his ignominious exit from the White Tiger Guild highlighted the complex dynamics of power, reputation, and secrecy within their world. Lee, a blend of firmness and a hint of menace in his tone, made it clear to Tu that while he was not certain of outright victory, he was confident enough to inflict significant damage, likening the potential aftermath to an assault by an entire military unit. He underscored his capability to neutralize Wu, particularly in close combat, leaving Tu visibly unsettled as he contemplated the array of weapons directed at him by Li. In the subsequent scene within Chu Ai's office, Li strategically laid out the cards of the Amti Monster Troop and the Blue Flower Guild on the table, drawing Chu attention away from the stock market data on his tablet. Chu, intrigued by the projections shared by Li, expressed skepticism about the promised financial windfall. Li's response, a confident smile, suggested a deep-seated belief in the accuracy of his financial forecasts. This interaction hinted at a potential partnership that could alter their fortunes significantly. As the person who had escorted Tu away from the Hope Guild, Building aired his grievances about their prolonged duty. He suggested Tu that perhaps they should consider embarking on a gate raid instead. Noticing Wo's clenched jaw and simmering anger, he inquired if everything was all right. Their conversation was abruptly interrupted by a businessman who approached with a clear disdain for the commotion caused by the guards. He directly addressed Wo, mistakenly identifying him as the group leader, and chided him for his apparent lack of vigilance over specific zones, mockingly suggesting Wu might be unfamiliar with the alphabet. The businessman's tone grew more derisive as he insinuated Wo's deficiency in basic literacy, stressing that if reading was beyond Wo's capabilities, he should at least strive to improve his auditory comprehension. Two sudden and violent outbursts against the businessman underscores a deep-seated frustration, manifesting in a physical assault that left the businessman incapacitated on the pavement. This aggressive reaction shocked the other guards, who felt powerless to intervene, highlighting his formidable presence and temper. In the aftermath of the attack, who still fueled by rage tasked one of the guards with locating a specific individual, hinting at further plans of retribution. The narrative shifts to a meeting between Lee and Park Chil Su, the leader of the Hope Guild. Park Chil Su, who possesses the analytical prowess of a hunter with the analyst class, plays a pivotal role in the story as Lee's benefactor. He is instrumental in uncovering the potential within rank F hunters and devising strategies to enhance their abilities. Despite Park Chalisu's skepticism, Lee's revelations and their implications for the future of the guild and its members introduce a dynamic of trust and potential transformation within the Hope Guild, promising a journey towards rediscovery and empowerment under Park Chalisu's guidance. Lee understood Park Chalisu's skepticism, recognizing that the promise of life-altering wealth was a bold claim. When Park Chiao Su scrutinized the recruitment cards spread out before him, he speculated whether Li had received insider information during recruitment efforts. In response, Li challenged Park Chiao Su with a question about trust based on his track record of actions. Taken aback, Park Chiao Su affirmed his trust in Li unequivocally. 
Lee, harboring knowledge from a past life, knew the claim was extraordinary and chose to bolster his credibility with text messages exchanged with Coke, detailing an exceptional offer to transition from an F rank to a commissioned officer. A rarity, Park Chile Su, inspecting the messages with keen interest, became convinced of Lee's sincerity. Offering his bank card, Lee revealed his intention to entrust Park Chile Su with his investment, mentioning the 20 million won inheritance from his parents as the starting capital. This gesture deeply moved Park Chile Su, who recognized the profound trust Lee placed in him and gratefully accepted the responsibility. This exchange not only fortified their mutual trust, but also set the stage for a partnership based on unprecedented faith and the potential for significant financial undertakings. In a poignant flashback, we witness Park Chil Su comforting a distraught Lee, offering reassurance in a world that narrowly defines talent through the lens of awakened powers. Park Chil Su's encouragement to Lee, emphasizing that everyone possesses talent, albeit unrecognized in the current era, serves as a beacon of hope. His belief that one day these latent talents will be acknowledged as superpowers reflects a deep understanding and compassion towards Lee's struggle. Fast forward to the present, Lee's gesture of entrusting his investment to Park Chil Su symbolizes more than a financial transaction. It represents a profound expression of gratitude and trust towards someone who stood by him when he was at his lowest. Lee's vision of the future includes humanity's encounters with otherworldly beings, a pivotal chapter that demands the acquisition and integration of advanced technologies to avert the impending gate crises. Recognizing the critical need for expertise in communication with these extraterrestrial entities, Lee strategically positions Park Chao Su at the helm of this initiative, leveraging his unique talents and their shared history to prepare for the monumental challenges ahead. This partnership underscores the intersection of personal bonds and strategic foresight in navigating the complexities of a world on the brink of transformation. In the bustling heart of Young Yuno's Blacksmith Alley, Lee inquired about the pricing of Mona's stones from a local shopkeeper, navigating the delicate dance of negotiation. Exiting the shop, his journey continued, weaving through the narrow back alleys with a singular focus, to align himself with the legendary prowess of the seven dwarven artisans for the creation of his first master grade item. Unbeknownst to him, a shadow trailed discreetly behind, a silent observer to his quest. Lee's path led him to a workshop where the sounds of metalworking filled the air. Here he greeted artisan Jungyu, recognized for his unparalleled skills yet ousted from the blacksmith's guild for his unconventional methods. Jungai's blunt dismissal of any interest beyond his displayed wares did little to deter Lee's intrigue. With a mix of respect and curiosity, Lee complied, turning his attention to the items on display while casting occasional glances at the artisan fervently shaping a broadsword.